he <clears throat> getting a bit of a uh, delayed start here. I was I was out taking a walk and um, lost track of time. So <laughs> hope you can hear me okay. Uh, hey everybody. Oh, maybe I'll do this. I hope other people's live streams are, are more organized than, than this. Um, really just wanted to hang out and answer questions uh, if you have questions. And uh, so uh, fire away if there's something that's on your mind that you are curious about or uh, confused about. And if it's in my wheelhouse, I will uh, do my best to answer. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Luke. Um, this is uh, peppermint tea. Very refreshing. Uh, John Prescott is requesting a song. Uh, sure, if, if, if I know it, uh, what's, what's the song, John? Michael Miller says, Adam, howdy, Adam, these days, do you start with a warm-up or do you go straight into practicing? and noodling? That's a good question. Um, uh, these days I'm, I'm warming up rarely. I, I don't love that answer because I, I do, I do like warming up, but I, I feel very busy and I get frustrated and, um, when I, when I pick up the guitar, I want to just get right to it. Um, I, I don't know if that's best, but that's my impulse. So, uh, yeah, I, I get into playing music and noodling and practicing and stuff. Uh, but I don't recommend that. I do think warming up, even if it's just for five minutes can be really helpful, uh, not just for your hands, but also just to convince your mind to slow down a little bit, because I think then you'll get a better practice session in anyway, if you can slow your mind down. So uh, John Prescott says something from Kibby Dango or a John Fahey tune. Hmm. Sure. Um, let me see. Um, get my phone out of my pocket and lock it down. There we go. <laughs> uh, okay. Let me put the camera down a little bit if, in case anyone wants to see the guitar. Um, is a good idea.
John, that was a, a little all over the place. Uh, well, everybody. Uh, see, kids, that's why you should warm up. Uh, I literally just went out for a walk uh, and came back and realized I was on air. So uh, pardon pardon my sloppiness uh, and stuff. Wow, lots of people here, though. Jeez, let me back up. Uh... Avraham Apatow says, you mentioned the benefits of fingerstyle over pick. When I do that, it sounds much duller. And when I record on my arch top and acoustic, it just doesn't seem as good a sound. Huh. Well, gosh, that's a good, that's a good thing to work on. Um, I have been playing on my bare finger. You know, I don't have any kind of nails to speak of. So I've been playing on, on my fingertips for years and I like that sound, but I get, yeah, I get that it's not for everybody. Uh, Abraham, I'm curious, have you, do you, are you playing with nails or are you just playing like me on, 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 on your bare fingertips? Um, I have a couple friends who, who get acrylic nails um, 
I don't know if he's still doing it, but last time I had a conversation with Blake Mills, this is a few years ago, um, he was doing acrylic nails. My friend Lainey Stern plays with uh, acrylic nails. Um, that might be something you'd, you'd want to try. If, if you like the sound of a pick, but um, you're trying to get more different, you know, finger style techniques, then that might be a way to go. Um, maybe even, you know, if there's a good classical guitar teacher uh, someplace where you live or even online, maybe you could take a few lessons and, and just work on tone. I, I do think that the benefits of, 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 you know, doing more with your fingers is great. If, if you're only playing one note at a time, um, well, it, it really depends on what you're trying to do. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that one technique is better than the other, but for what I'm trying to do, I like it better. Um, I can get, you know, more layers of things going and counterpoint and stuff. Um, even just like a, a chord, like a basic chord. Oh, you can't see my hand here. How can I do this? Gosh. Maybe I'll move back a little bit. I don't know. You know, a, 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 a ba like this is a pretty basic chord, D major seven. But with a pick, you know, I can hit the whole thing. Or I suppose I could jump around. Just feels like with fingers, I can give more an impression of you know, just more layers of stuff. So that that's why I like it. Um, you know, I mean, there's always playing uh, hybrid and, and using both, but I, I still think if, if, the, if the issue is the dullness, then I would look into um, acrylics. Uh, R. Bloomfield says, I've been working on improving my triad knowledge all over the neck. What is the next step? Practice uh, phasing ideas with tr on practice phasing phrasing ideas with triads. Uh, that's from Rome Bloomfield. Uh, well, I guess it depends on on the, the particulars of the style. I, I have this thing on my music stand. Uh, this I downloaded this from TedGreen.com. You can find it there. It's called Progressions Derived from Triad Chord Streams. And uh, it's a neat exercise for, for, for what I think you're asking about. Um, it goes like this. It's in three, four. So one, two, three. exercise that you can get you can download that for free from tedgreen.com and i find that use that kind of thing useful for doing more with triads uh, there's closed triads it starts out with closed and by the third line you've got these spread triads which i don't know that might be something you haven't even gotten into yet Try 
that. Uh, just and then you could just try playing melodies, you know. Um, too but mostly was trying to think about triad so yeah that's what i would do uh more from luke luke how do you work on performance listen to people like segovia and elizabeth cotton they're so inside the tune every single bar how do you work on that and make it feel fluid and natural boy luke that's that's a million dollar question right there i love that um uh, yeah, well, then you have to practice playing. If you're just practicing scales and stuff, then you're not going to get to that level of performance. Mm -hmm. Scales can be your, your warm up, uh, but you have to practice playing the tune. I think you have to practice playing the tune without your guitar like to be able to sing it in your head. Uh, and hear the whole thing going on. And I mean, I'm, I'm sharing that this is something uh, Aaron Shearer, great classical guitarist and uh, teacher wrote about this. He, he has a three volume series on, on classical guitar. And there's a whole chapter, I think, in volume two about memorizing things and preparation. And he has a whole process. Uh, you, you can look into it if you want to. But the short of it is um, tr trying to get more of it into your memory, whether you're learning it off the page or off of a record or whether it's a song that you wrote. Um, it has to be fully... Uh, present in your mind before you pick up the guitar. Otherwise you're just working on muscle memory and that's um, can be useful, but has its limitations. So uh, have it clearly in your mind and then you could try visualizing yourself, playing it on the guitar, singing it, move your body to it, really get the whole thing and only work on as much of it at a time as you can do that with. So if you can make four bars feel really good, uh, work on that and then maybe try to get six bars or eight bars and keep growing that. But yeah, the main thing is the, the music has to really uh, be inside you. So a lot of the practice, I don't know how Segovia practiced or Elizabeth Cotton, but a lot of thing, a lot of what's helpful to me is thinking about playing when I don't have the guitar in my hand, or like if I'm trying to learn songs for a show, maybe I'm playing guitar for, for somebody else as an accompanist. I'll spend a lot of time just listening to the songs. Uh, without guitar in hand and, and just trying to, to, you know, to the point where I can sing along. I, I know the, the dynamic arc. I know every place it's supposed to go. So um, this is kind of going to sound extreme, but, you know, imagine just cut off your arms for a while and put the guitar away. I guess you should put the guitar away first before you cut your arms off. That'll make it easier. And get the music all in your, in your, in your mind and in everywhere that you can in, in your in your spirit, your body. And then when you're ready, put your 
well, you know, visualize it, maybe smell the guitar, taste the guitar, and use all your senses, and then get your arms back on and take the guitar out of the case and pick up your guitar. That should be the very last thing. The guitar is just a, a, a tool to, um, to amplify the music that's inside of you. Okay. Uh, Avram says, my punim looks good. Thanks, Avram. Um, that's my Hebrew name. Uh, my Hebrew family name is Avram, Avram Shmuel. Uh, so, nice. Uh, Michael Miller, how can you go about reducing buzz, getting feedback from other strings while doing fretboard acrobatics with arpeggios? Do you always meet with your left hand or any other tips for keeping it clean? That's a good question. Um, for me, yeah, it's a combination of left hand and right hand. I'm trying to think of, let's see, I'll, I'll play some arpeggio. I don't know any fretboard acrobatics, but I'll think of an arpeggio. Um, so you can't really see my picking hand here, but um, it's turned this way when I play a lot of times. And that's in part because I like how the pick angle, I like how it sounds with the pick kind of turned in, but also it allows me to use some of this stuff to mute the strings, the lower strings, once I once I get away from them, I'm kind of resting this stuff on the lower strings. So that's muting. Yeah, muting is really both hands. And I would just practice stuff really slowly and record yourself and, and try to be really aware of exactly which moves you're doing that are that are the problem. Not just think of it as a big global problem, but look for something specific, maybe changing from a, one string to another or one finger to another, and see if you can isolate that thing and, and work on it. Buzzing is hard. I'm still working that out. I, I was playing flat wound strings for 10 years, and there's really not a lot of buzz on flat wound strings. So uh, I could get away with murder. And I've recently been playing on round wounds again, and it, it sounds very, very noisy to me. Um, make sure, though, again, that you record it and, and record it like record them with the mic as close to your amp as possible or if you're playing acoustic just i guess just record whatever you can record but um you're when you're playing the guitar you're in a prime position to hear all of the buzz as you you know that kind of stuff and i don't know that it it is really as loud to other people as it is to to you or to me um, it might be, but you need to investigate that because if it's just something that is bothering you, but that doesn't really, uh, it's not really part of what people notice when they listen to you, then I wouldn't worry about it. If it is a problem, again, uh, practice slowly, try to isolate the specific, instead of looking at it as, as a big, pro big problem all over the place, try to figure out which specific kinds of moves that you're doing that are the most problematic and, and work on those uh, first. Uh, you might, let's see. You might have to lift off more when you shift. sure i don't know what your challenges specifically are but yeah try to isolate them and not look at it as just one big mess um oh ben is here uh ben says i play fingers only the only time i miss it is when i'm strumming any good finger strumming advice um, <laughs> strum 
yeah, I wish I could get my camera to show you more of what I'm doing. Um, I'm going to play over here, even though really I would play over here. I, when I'm strumming, I guess I, with, without a pick, I'll sometimes do like this. That's my, I have two moves. That's one move. And the other one is just to hold my hand as if there's a pick. So what's, I guess what's really happening is I'm using the back of this nail a lot. that soft sound if you want more more like a pick sound i would use the the pick of no pick which is really just the back of the nail <laughs> jam with five guitar players and a mandolin player and, and a fiddle and banjo, I think bring a pick. Uh, don't bring a fingernail to a pick fight. Uh, you, you're going you're gonna to need uh, the volume that, that you get from a pick. But if you're, if you're doing something gentle or if you're just in a recording studio where they can adjust the levels, then, then I think you can do, do whatever you like. Uh, Sergio, Sergio says new 335. No, it might seem new because I don't play it here a lot, but this is actually quite old. It's a 1979, take this thing up. It's a 1979 Gibson ES 335 TD. Uh, maybe you can see the badge in there. I'm not sure if that really translates or not. Uh, Oh, because it's up here. Yeah, there's the badge. Um, I've had this guitar since 1979. It was a bar mitzvah present from my father. So not new to me uh, and not new in the world. Uh, but I just, I don't play it that much. I had kind of retired it for a little bit. Um, and I felt like playing it today. I have a gig tonight. I might play it on the gig. I just put some new strings on it. So it's a little, all that noisy, buzzy stuff is more present right now because these strings are, are I just put them on this morning. when I, um, Before I went out for a walk, I changed my guitar strings. But I love this guitar. I, I call this guitar Esther. Um, you can see I've played a lot of the finish off the back of the neck. It's, it's got some wear and tear. It's pretty clean. It's got this sticker on it that I, that I put on there years ago. Breathe, groove, energize. So I see that when I look down. That's helpful. Thanks for asking, Sergio. Uh, sometimes I do that thing where I act like I'm holding a pick, too. I thought I was crazy. Ben, you are not crazy. That is a totally valid technique. Uh, Michael Miller says, what's the most impactful book you've ever read? I assume you're talking about music books um, and not just any kind of book. Uh, if, if you're asking about music books, I would say the most impactful book I've read in music is The Advancing Guitarist by Mick Goodrick. Uh, I happened to read it just at the right time when I really needed it. Uh, I didn't have a teacher. I had already gone through music school, but I still was curious about a lot of things that I that I heard people do on the guitar, especially in jazz. Um, uh, I was curious about modern harmony on the guitar, which I didn't. My school was great. I loved my education. It was at the, a place called the Dick Grove School of Music, but it wasn't. Uh, 
you know, it got, it got me really far. But then, you know, when I got into my mid twenties, I was still curious about stuff and I was hearing more kind of, I don't know how else to describe it, but more modern harmonies. And that Mick Goodrick book really helped me understand where some of that stuff was coming from. Um, it helped me keep growing technically on the guitar. There's a lot of stuff in there about playing uh, uh, horizontally and vertically and then trying to integrate that, uh, about playing in all keys, regardless of where you are on the fretboard. So, that, so that's the book that impacted me um, the most. And I just really like wrung it dry, um, got everything I could out of it. Of course, now when I go back and look at it, I still find stuff that I didn't notice before. So either I just skipped it or I wasn't ready for it, but it's a, that's an amazing book. I would highly recommend it. The Advancing Guitarist by Mick Goodrick. And that relates to a question here. Somebody was asking about, oh, hey, Florian, good to see you too. Rich, uh, somebody's asking about Johnny Smith. Uh, where is it? Oh, Sergio, thank you so much. That's a really nice thing to say. Um, where did somebody say about Johnny Smith? Oh, it's still Sergio. It says Johnny Smith played horizontally. Why nobody teaches that? I don't know. Uh, I think it's a really cool way to play. Um, uh, as opposed to playing this way, like... Um, You could play. particularly a Johnny Smith kind of idea, but I was trying to, to move uh, chord shapes up and down the neck this way rather than this way. I don't know why people don't teach that so much. Uh, the caged system seems to be the, the prevalent uh, teaching method for, um, for a lot of schools, and it's very useful. Uh, but there's also this whole horizontal way of playing that uh, is also really useful. Uh, read the Mick Goodrick book. He, he gets into that. Uh, okay. Uh, John Crescott says, when learning from a book, say Ted Green's Chord Chemistry, what pace would you recommend? I think I tend to rush through the material a little too much. Yeah, you, you probably do. Uh, it's really hard for me to recommend a pace since I don't know you. I don't know where you're at. Um, I don't know. Really, that's 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 really hard to generalize. Um, but on the whole, I would say it's a good idea to stay with one thing longer and get what you can out of it. That's a nice thing about finding a, a page that you like from techgreen.com. Um, this is not a hundred page book, it's just a page. So when I put this on my music stand, I can pretend that that's all there is. Well, of this, that is all there is, but I, I'm not intimidated by the other 99 pages that I need to get through. Um, there's a lot there and, um, in a lot of cases, not, not, not on this particular sheet, but in a lot of cases, when you find one of these uh, worksheets from Ted, there's even notes for what to do next. Like it's in this key now, but try it in this other key, or it's on this string set now, 
make sure you try it on this other string set. So he does give you plenty to do. I like having, you know, one sheet uh, on my music stand. I mean, you can see my music stand. It's a little messier than that right now. Uh, I've got this Jimmy Weibel book that I was revisiting. It's really cool uh, book. If you can find this, it's pretty hard to find. It's called Classical Country. It's got his first six etudes in it and some good preparatory exercises. Um, I've got some uh, sonatas and partitas. This is from Bach. Again, though, I just I just printed out what I needed. And I wasn't looking at the whole book, which can be intimidating. Uh, this is something I found in a in a store for three dollars, and it's just it's got some nice little exercises, classical guitar things to work on. Um, another Ted Green study. What else is on here? <laughs> this quite a lot actually it's a whole library on my music stand uh, what every musician needs to know about the body this is a really useful book uh, and what else monk some Thelonious monk and uh, another Jimmy Wilde book um, I don't know why he's been on my mind a lot lately so that's what's on my music stand. Uh, but yeah, with, with chord chemistry, that's like the whole encyclopedia in a way. So I would just photocopy a page or two and put them on your stand and put the book away and spend as much time as, as you feel you need to with, with those things. Um, Andy Wilson says, have you ever practiced Baroque phrasing like Ted Green showed in his famous video? No, uh, when I was studying with Ted, that was not what I was interested in. And I didn't, I didn't hear him do that until uh, a workshop that uh, in the early 90s, he came to the National Guitar Summer Workshop where I was teaching. And he, he gave a, a, a master class there and did some of that stuff. And I had never heard it before. So, but when I had studied with him, it was it was prior to that, uh, more in the in the late eighties, and because I wasn't interested in it, I never had heard him. I never asked him about it, so I never heard him do it. Uh, I have tried to work through some of his baroque uh, worksheets from his website, and it's really hard. I, I I can only think he must have just practiced that stuff so so much because just to do the simplest part you know the stuff that was probably simple to him would take a really i think a really long time to, to get together technically conceptually he made it sound like oh just stealing bach licks it's just you know melodies and but most the way most people play the guitar is so different from that that uh, I think it would take a lot of practice to just get in that zone, but it would be worth it because uh, it's a beautiful sound. If, if you guys don't know what we're talking about, um, uh, Andy, if you have a favorite uh, Ted Green Baroque video, maybe you can share it in the chat here. James Abraham. Uh, Stephen McClurg says, uh, any luck with the Goodrick Harmony book? I feel like I'm learning from it, but I'm not sure what. No, I, I, I at different times I've, I've have taken a peek at the, at the Goodrick Harmony book. I, I assume you're talking about the big Mr. Good Chord, um, voice leading book. Or are you talking about the book that he wrote with Tim Miller about modal compression harmony? That one I really struggled with. Um, yeah, it was hard for me to, to get um, excited about that book, e even though I think there's a lot of great material there. I, it, it, for some reason, it didn't it doesn't didn't resonate with me, but. For somebody else, that that could be totally different. S Stephen, let me know which which specific uh, Mick Good Rick Harmony book you're talking about. Uh, David Dewey's says, um, "Oh, Michael, I'll, I'll answer your 
your book question in a second. David Dewey says, I'm working on your tune, Charlie Rich, and to fill it out with an improvised section, I'm thinking of using thirds and sixths. Could you play through a chorus improvising that way? Sure. So I'm just gonna play. This is the tune um, for anyone who doesn't know. Yeah, Stephen, the Mr. Good Chord book, uh, no. I'm, I've, I've played through a couple of things. I've had friends that send me, you know, PDFs with a few pages here and there. Um, I love that idea of it. I mean, like voice leading and just playing chords. I used to practice that kind of thing all the time. Not to, you know, not to the depth that you see it in that book, but... Um, I would practice chord scales and cycle exercises. And um, I think that book is about cycles and voicing types. And I used to practice that kind of stuff a lot more. Um, so maybe I would like it if I, if I got into it. But I mean, for one thing, those books are really hard to find now if you're looking for a hard copy. Um, so that's, that's another thing. But I was just, I, yeah, I get intimidated by these big books. Same with the, the George Van Epps harmonic mechanisms, the, you know, three, three fat books. Um, maybe I need to just get over that, you know, uh, bibliophobia or whatever that is. Uh, James Abraham, the Beato book is great. Can be a bit overwhelming because it's exhaustive. Great book, though. That's cool. I've never... Uh, Never got to check out the Beato book. Maybe I should just buy it and check it out. Um, yeah, that's good to hear. I, I, I haven't talked to anybody uh, who's worked through it, but that's that's good to know. Uh, yeah, the almanac of guitar voice leading. Whew. Even the title is, <laughs> it sounds like a lot. 
Uh, would love to hear about your most not about your non music related most impactful book too. Um, uh, there's a book by Linda Berry that's called What It Is, and it's a book about creative writing and creativity and memory and imagination. And uh, I think that's a great book, had a lot of impact on me. I have to say, I, I saw her give a workshop. In, I, you know, I went to a workshop of hers. This is probably 10 years ago or 12 years ago, maybe. Um, so I kind of got a double dose of the ideas of that book. First, I saw her just talk, talk it, you know, not reading from the book, but just giving this workshop. And then when I got the book, you know, it's a lot of the same stuff, but I had a real sense of what she was talking about because I got to also hear it in her voice. But still, I think that's a great book on creativity. Um, uh, Austin Cleon's book, Steal Like an Artist, had a big impact on me. Um, going back... Uh, years ago, I read a book called Writing Down the Bones, uh, which I found really helpful just about creative writing. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I read a book, I can't remember the author's name now, it's called Harmonic Wealth. It's kind of a self help book you would think maybe it's a music book because it's called harmonic wealth but it had nothing to do with uh, um you know harmonics or anything like that um but yeah it's just about manifesting wealth in your life in various areas and that book i don't remember a lot about it now a friend of mine gave it to me but it did have a big impact, a very real impact on my life because one of the things that he said to do was to do something for your community uh, that's just about doing for your community. It's, uh, it's, and you know, do it something that you can do regularly. And that's how guitar tips started. I wouldn't, I think I wouldn't be on YouTube if it weren't for reading that, even though he doesn't say go on YouTube and start a channel. Uh, that's what I did. I thought that's how I could serve my community. I don't, um, you know, I don't have a tip jar here. I don't have, I don't put my Venmo, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not here asking anybody for money. I, I'm just glad to, to talk with you for a little bit and make videos and share what I can. And so I would say in, in a very real way that that book impacted me, even though I don't remember anything else about it, except for that bit. Um, here I am, you know, eight or 10 years later, still YouTubing, and it's largely because of that book. So, um, John Prescott says, if you really want to dig deep into music and guitar, but without doing a complete undergrad degree, what do you suggest? I'm 23 and already graduated college, so I don't want to do all of that over again. Hmm. Uh, John, tell me more. Yeah, I have the same question as James. What, what do you want to learn? Jazz, improvisation, and composition. Um. If you want to learn jazz improvisation, I think transcribe a lot. You know, find things that excite you in music on recordings and figure out what it is. If, if you're musically literate, you could write it down. I, I think that's a useful part of it. Um, and and play it like that's going to develop your ears it's going to develop your musical vocabulary I, I i posted something here yesterday on youtube about you know not thinking too much about scales scales are useful but um they're not the whole enchilada and uh 
more than scales or any kind of music theory. Just listen to the music. The music exists. You're not, as far as I, if, if you're talking about jazz improvisation, um, yes, improvising is the act of doing something that has never been done before. You're making something up on the spot. Um, but jazz exists now. Like there's, you know, nearly a hundred years of recorded jazz and you could learn lots of it from any era, you know, focus on the stuff that you like the most and just transcribe it. Um, I do think that Mick Goodrick book is a really good one for understanding some theory. I don't, uh, well, the book that I like for composing is another one of these books that's really hard to find, but maybe you can find a PDF of it. Uh, Lainey Stern has a book. Uh, her name is Lainey, L-E-N-I Stern, has a book called uh, Composing and Compositions or something like that. And uh, that is a great book. I found that book to be really, really inspiring. But it's out of print and hard to find. So look for it on eBay or maybe you can find a PDF of it someplace. That's a really, really good book. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Those are the things. Uh, there's there's a book by Derek Bailey called Improvisation that is not a how-to book, but it's just interviews with a lot of improvisers. I read that when I was about your age, when I was probably 23 or something like that. I found it really inspiring. It doesn't tell you what, you know, what to do on the guitar, but it's just a lot of great ideas. Um, John Zorn has a book series called Arcana. There's several volumes, and those are all interviews with improvisers. Um, if you live somewhere where you can go hear music, go go hear music as often as you can, it, like in the room with music happening, if, if that's possible where you are. Um, and just start writing like I, I went to school and, and studied composition but um, I think that the main way that I learned how to write was just to write a lot you know don't be afraid to make mistakes like try stuff out and and play it and and just you have to be a little bit fearless and and that's, that's something I can't really teach you other than to tell you it's true if if you want to get good at writing music, you have to write a lot of music and you have to be unafraid of that. Um, make a challenge to yourself that you write something new every day for 10 days or 30 days or 100 days or whatever. And um, that's where you're going to learn about writing, I think. Uh, Rome, I I see that you you said that you were going to put the link to the to the Ted Green exercise, but I I don't see it. Did you actually link it? Maybe I can do that. I'm googling right now. I'm still looking here. Hang in there, everybody. Oh, now I can't find it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Well, I don't want to spend too much time doing that. But yeah, if somebody has that link, I would appreciate it. Um, what else? Andy Wilson, may I ask you to play some melodic and lyric phrases on a 251 in A minor? Uh, a minor, B minor 7 flat 5, uh, E7. Sure. So you're saying. set up. I wish I did, but you have to imagine that. The train but uh that's what i'm that's what i'm trying to do oh you can't include links that's a shame uh just yeah go to ted green's site click on chord studies and scroll down yeah that's the one thank you john prescott uh is that the idea that you were asking andy let me, let me try that a little bit more one two oh two staying purely in those chords, but I am thinking of the chords that you said. Uh, once you start playing, or once I start playing, uh, I'm thinking just about forward motion. So sometimes the B minor 7 flat 5, I might change to B7. And sometimes the E7, I might change to B flat 7 my mind uh, or there might be other substitutions but that's I'm trying to stay pure to what you said two three four
there, <laughs> I started playing Lullaby of Birdland. That's a tune. That'd be a good tune to, to, to learn, to, to, to get around on those kind of changes. Hey, Mike. Wow. Uh, Shuvo Das says, do you always think of chords when playing? I would say 70 to 75% I think of chords when I'm playing. Uh, so, for example, just now, I was thinking, well, because that was the question about playing over those chords, but I'm not just thinking about the chords, I'm also thinking about the shapes of those chords. Like, I'm thinking about actual, you know, shapes, not, not only the names of the chords and the notes of the chords, but forms on the fretboard and, and playing out of those. Um, I, th I play that way a lot. You can also just play pure melody. For, for me, when I want to get away from chord forms, I really just have to play on one string and then there's no chords there. It's just a, you know, there's just, is that one dimension or two? I guess that's um, one dimension. have to think pure melody so i do make myself do that sometimes because um uh i just feel like i lean on the chords too much and uh it's it has a certain kind of sound uh okay this will be the last question oh well okay two questions how do you develop an internal pulse thank you clive um Uh, how do you develop an internal pulse? I think that you do without a metronome. You play for a while, you record yourself, you listen to it. You play for a while, you record yourself, you listen to it. Try to hear what's going on. Maybe your pulse is better than you think. Maybe it's not so hot. Um, just work on it. Uh, try to find out where your weak points are, where if, if there's a, any kind of obvious if it's obvious to you, like, oh, yeah, I'm always rushing when I do this, or I'm always dragging when I do that, try to fix those things. And then just think about music. You know, you have to hear music in your imagination before you put your fingers on the strings. I, I used to play in an R&B band uh, in my early 20s when I graduated music school. I was in a band called Drive All Night. And anytime I'd ask the band leader, his name is Charles, uh, Charlie Mead, and ask him, oh, yeah, how does that one tune go? And, you know, some people you'd ask that question and they would just start singing it. Oh, it goes, sugar pie, honey bunch, you know I love you. But he wouldn't do that. Charlie would, if you asked him how a tune went, he would just get real still for a minute. And it was like the music was like coming alive inside his imagination. And he would start just feeling the beat. And then maybe he'd like sing the bass line. Boom, boom, boom. You know, and then he'd hear the melody. Like, he wasn't a good singer, but in his way, he was kind of like Bobby McFerrin. Um, like, he got everything going on in his body before he said, Oh, it goes like this. So, you know, you have that in you. I think if you love music, then I think you have that in you, or at least you, you could cultivate it. So, um, yeah, work on music away from the guitar a lot. And then if you have a good pulse, you just have to get your hands to catch up. Um, Sergio says, can you use blues scales over standards? Yes, sometimes. I'll, I'll play Stella by Starlight. That's that's a standard, I think. And I'll, I'll try to use some blues scales over that. And that, that'll be my last little bit here. Um, uh, if anybody's interested, I have a Patreon uh, site. It's called Guitar Tips Pro. I actually have two. Uh, the other one's called Guitar Alone. If you're interested in solo guitar playing, you could check out Guitar Alone. If you're interested in guitar stuff more generally, you could check out Guitar Tips Pro. That stuff is on Patreon. Um, thank you if you're interested in that. And if you're already there, I know there's a couple people here who, who are patrons, uh, so thank you. 
guys for supporting. Um, so I'm going to play Stella and try to play some blues in it. I do that all the time. Why not? Um, it's the language of the, you know, blues is, is uh, the mother tongue of jazz. It is the um, lingua franca of the guitar. You're a guitar player, I presume. You play some blues. Uh, yes, of course. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate you tuning in and asking great, great questions. Um, I'll be back here next Tuesday and uh, take good care. Okay.